Well, good morning and welcome to St. Mark's Community Church. My name is Pete Stearns. I'm one of our pastors here and thrilled to be back with you uh, this weekend as we continue our Bless Your Heart series. I I hope you've noticed in these uh, little sermon teasers that we've been highlighting uh, different neighborhoods that we as a church are actively seeking to bless. Last week, we saw a snapshot of Macintosh by the Lake that so many of us uh, call home. And 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 this week, looking at at Elon, this, uh, this college right in our our backyard that, that we absolutely love as a community. Uh, again, Megan said it earlier, but I want to encourage you, if you are involved with Elon in any capacity, uh, to join us afterwards to have a lunch. It's, it's just a chance to be able to connect with others that, that, that call that place their mission field uh, and, and to be encouraged in your walk with, with Jesus in that space. Uh, this series, Bless Your Heart, is really intended Uh, to be a practical way for us to embody the gospel message in the midst of a a fairly divisive season in our nation. It's a chance for us to actually act upon Jesus' greatest commandment. Jesus' greatest commandment comes to us in in, in Matthew 22. Uh, there's There's a teacher of the law that comes to Jesus and is trying to get Jesus to stumble. Uh, But really, he invites Jesus to articulate his understanding, his summary of all of the Torah, all of Scripture, the prophets at that time. And and this would have been a reasonably common thing for rabbis to do. Rabbis at that time, they had had various laws and regulations and restrictions, but but they typically could summarize all of those things in, in, in one specific sentiment. And so this teacher of the law comes to Jesus and and seeks to receive that summary. And and how Jesus responds beautifully shapes our picture of the gospel message and, and hopefully shapes our understanding of how we should engage in the world. So let's look at Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now I want to pause here for a minute because Jesus is referring to a a, a passage and and an understanding that would have been remarkably familiar to the Jewish people of that day. This was the Shema. This was the Shema that was was written on their door frames. It It was written on little scrolls and placed on their forehead. This would have been central to their understanding of what it meant uh, to, to be a devout follower of Yahweh. But then Jesus is going to add something. And what he adds is going to completely revolutionize the way that the Jewish people understand their invitation to follow after God. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And so over the course of this series, we're asking ourselves, How do we practically embody Jesus' invitation to love our neighbors? What does it look like for each and every one of us to recognize our responsibility to extend the gospel message to those that live in closest proximity to us? We've been using this really simple framework. It's an acronym by, by, by Dave and John Ferguson, and, and, and the hope is that this acronym will be emblazoned in our minds. It will be a constant reminder for what it means, what it's going to take for each of us to lean into this lofty call. Last week, Jarm started us off by simply saying that we always begin in prayer. If we're going to love our neighbor, it begins in our prayer prayer. We are not able to love our neighbor if we are not first praying for them. And it seems simple, and it seems obvious, and and yet I'll admit that, that I don't often pray for the people that live in closest proximity to me if they haven't asked for those prayers. My prayer life is, is, is usually occupied by, by my needs and also the needs of others that have come to me and asked me if I would be praying for them in in seasons of trauma or seasons of drama, right? My prayer life is, is occupied by the people that I love the most. 
And so prior to this series, prior to, 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 to studying this, this kind of framework and this method of engaging in love for our neighbors, it was pretty rare that I prayed for the neighbor that I didn't know four or five doors down. And yet we recognized last week that if we're not praying for that neighbor, we can't possibly expect to love that neighbor. If we're not praying for that neighbor, we can't possibly expect our hearts to be tuned to bless that neighbor. And so if we are hungry to lean into Jesus' invitation that he says all of the law and prophets hang on to love our neighbor, it starts by praying for our neighbor. But you know what I find really interesting? When we pray for our neighbor, when we pray that we might be a blessing to our neighbor, there always seems to be an opportunity to act upon that prayer. Every time I find myself praying for somebody that hasn't necessarily asked for my prayers, I always find that God places them in my path and allows me an opportunity to lean into the prayers that I have been offering for them. It, it, it's almost like this spiritual cause and effect. We're going to look at, at that reality that, that James talks to us about in chapter 1. We're going to spend most of our time uh, reading James chapter 1. And, and James is going to offer us uh, practical wisdom for living in community with one another. That was what he was seeking to do uh, with the early church. And, and it continues to be relevant for you and I. And so he's going to be speaking about this cause and effect here in James chapter 1 verses 22 through 25. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, at first glance, this passage feels fairly heavy-handed. Read the law, study the law, obey the law, right? That, that's what it feels like. But, but we're forgetting that, that James, throughout this message, is framing his understanding of the word, the logos, the word that comes alive in us, and the law in terms of the way that his brother understood it. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, why do we care what James's brother thought about the scripture and the law and the prophets? Well, James's brother is Jesus, right? And, and so Jesus is pretty relevant in, in a study of, of, of what the, the living word uh, means to us. I always love, Andy Stanley says, that if you ever find yourself doubting or skeptical that Jesus is God, then, then open up to James and, and become convinced. Because what would your brother or sister have to see in you to believe that you were in fact the Messiah? Right, James is this compelling witness because he has grown up with Jesus. He has argued over whose toys were whose with Jesus. He has competed with Jesus in foot races and in the streets of, of Nazareth and, and Bethlehem. And yet he looks at his brother and he surrenders to him as his Lord and Savior. So there's this power in James's words here. And so when James is talking about obeying the word that is implanted in us, he's talking about this living word that comes to life through our relationship with our Savior. When he talks about, about leaning into and following after the way of the law, he's referring back to that great commandment. He's inviting us to embody the commandment of Jesus to love God and to love our neighbors. And I think what he alludes to here is that if we are fervently praying that God would give us an opportunity to live out his greatest commandment, the opportunity will be given freely to us. And now we are called to engage it. Now we are called to bless 
to love the neighbor that is there in the path before us. But here's the thing. I have found that rarely is that opportunity convenient. Rarely is the opportunity to to bless my neighbor easy. More often than not, it causes me to sacrifice my time, my comfort, and my resources. And so I find myself fairly regularly retreating from that opportunity. Seeing that this person that I have been praying for, God has brought into my path and they have solicited to me a need, a request to be blessed. And I think to myself, ooh, right now is not a good time. And so what do I say? I dismiss it by saying, I'll pray for you. And that's a dangerous kind of prayer because that's a prayer without intention and without expectation. It's a prayer that says, I'm willing to think about you But if God calls me to be the answer to that prayer, I'm unwilling to follow and do what he says. And what does James say we are like if we enter into prayer with that posture? Like someone that looks in the mirror and then immediately after walking away forgets what they look like. James says that's like somebody that's bowing down, that's praying fervently that their neighbor would be blessed and then when the opportunity to love them is presented, forgets why they were praying in the first place. I love after that greatest commandment, Jesus tells this story. It's a story that that is so familiar to many of us. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, there's a man who who, uh, embarks on a journey. And somewhere along the journey, uh, he is attacked. There are robbers that come, they beat him, they steal what he has, and they leave him on the side of the road for dead. But that man is fortunate because shortly after he's been left for dead, a priest comes along the street. Surely this priest, who's a devout believer, a follower of God, will see this man's wounds, his his, his pain, and bring healing and restoration to him. But what does the priest do? Crosses to the other side and, and walks away. Considers his own comfort, his own convenience, and says, right now is not a good time. Shortly after the priest comes, a a Levite, a devout believer, comes along. Surely uh, this Levite will stop, but again, the Levite doesn't. And this week I found myself wondering if that priest and that Levite are like you and I. Praying that God would transform and redeem the world, that God would bring restoration to the brokenness that we see in all of his creation, that God would bring peace in the midst of division, that he would bring joy in the midst of sorrow. And yet, when they saw the opportunity to be a conduit of that gospel, a conduit of that prayer, they ignored it and crossed to the other side of the road and walked away. How often, We find ourselves, just like the priest and Levite, praying without intention, praying without expectation, praying without any sentiment that if my prayer is answered and I am invited into an opportunity to bless and love those who are uncomfortable to bless and love, that I'll actually participate in what God is doing. And so it leaves us in this place asking, so what should we be doing? What should we do? How do we act on our prayers? And and the short answer is, I don't know. I'm not gonna be able to answer that question for each and every one of us because the, the word of God that's imparted in us, the living word of God that is dwelling within our spirit that comes to us through our active prayer and our study of scripture is gonna invite us into opportunities that are unique and nuanced and contextualized and different one neighborhood to the next, one neighbor to the next. But what I will say is our capacity to do the thing that we are praying to have God do in us always begins in our ability to listen. Our ability to listen to God who's stirring in us and our ability to listen to our neighbor that God has placed in our path.
to recognize their hurt and their pain, to see past the facade of the world and instead see them as they truly are, children of God. Now, my family, we go on a lot of uh, road trips. Uh, We're in this kind of phase where we've got uh, three kids under the age of seven, and so uh, flying is basically off the table. It's no fun to fly with with three little kids. It doesn't work out very well. It costs a lot of money. And so uh, we load them up into the minivan, and and we do our vacations to the beach or the mountains or something like that. But uh, I imagine some of you guys can relate that, that our car feels a little bit like a clown car when we load all of those kids in. And each and every one of my kids likes to do something different on a road trip, uh, which makes it really challenging for Brittany and I. Archer, uh, our middle son, always wants to uh, listen uh, to an audiobook, right? He always wants to listen to a story, stare out the window as, as, as he hears this narrative unfolding in front of him. My youngest son, Finley, he, also, he always wants to scream and cry uh, the whole time, um, That's how I usually feel as well on our road trips. I just want to scream and cry holding the wheel. Uh, We're going to make it. It's just a a stage, right? Uh, And and, and so he always wants to scream and cry. And then Shepard, in the back seat, he always wants to just play on his tablet and have those big headphones on, right? And and so, look, we're not trying to win any awards from a mommy blog, so we just give him the tablet. And we're like, hey, if that's going to satisfy you for this ride, you go ahead, have at it, play all of your games. We flip on an audio book uh, on, the, on, the, on the stereo for, for Archer to listen to and daydream to. And then we work tirelessly for the first 30 minutes of the ride to get Finley to fall asleep. Right, We put the cover on his car seat. We attach the, 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 the mobile sound machine that has this white noise that's kind of putting me to sleep at the wheel. Uh, Brittany contorts her body to, to, to shake the car seat as best she can to, to get in this rhythm that, that, that soothes our, our, our little boy to sleep. And every once in a while, the stars align and there's silence in the car. Finley sleeping Archer's listening to a story, Shepard's on the back playing some game on his tablet, and, and, and it's just this pure bliss, right? It's the only silence Brittany and I ever experience. It, it, if we're in this state and we arrive at our destination, we pretend that we haven't, and we just keep driving. It's like, hey, let's go get some coffee, let's do something, uh, because we're not gonna interrupt this, right? We're gonna have this time, uh, this peace and quiet to be with one another. Well, well on these road trips, inevitably, there comes a time where we have to get Shepard's attention, right? And Shepard, he's got this hyper focus on the tablet. He is locked in. And so it usually takes us a few minutes of waving our arms frantically that in hopes that he'll see us out of the periphery of his eye. Why? Because we do not want to wake up Finley. And, and, and so oftentimes Brittany will take a sock off and, and, and throw it back and kind of hit Shepard and he'll look up. And once we've gotten Shepard's attention, once he's looking at us, what do we do? We whisper and we mouth enthusiastically, Shepard, take your headphones off. And Shepard looks at us straight in the eyes and he's got this little grin on his face and he says, what? Take my headphones off? And Finley starts sobbing and crying and then Archer starts fussing because now he can't hear his story anymore. And, and it just turns into the very chaos that we were trying to avoid. Do I have anyone else that can relate to that experience, right? Yes, I, I, think, I think many of us. But here's the thing. Shepard wasn't intending to cause harm. Shepard wasn't intending to, to wake up his little brother. Shepard wasn't intending to disturb the peace. He genuinely wanted to know what we were asking him to do. He just couldn't hear us. And I think so often that's the case for us in in our faith journey is that we genuinely want to bless our neighbors. We genuinely want to love those people that God has placed in our path. And so we take action before we listen. And oftentimes the action that we take before listening to the spirit of God within us, before listening to the voice of the neighbor can cause more harm than it can good. James continues in in James chapter one in verse 19 now to talk about this tension, to talk about this spiritual reality. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, 
and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, at first glance, this passage seems to be these two ideas that are completely disparate from one another, and they're just jammed together in almost this proverbial statement here. First, we start, what's, what's James telling us? He's inviting us to listen. And I like that James doubles down on listening, right? He doesn't say it once, but he says it twice, and he says it in two different ways, because I think he knows that the early church and the church today has a hard time listening. So what does he say? He says, be quick to listen, and, and oh yeah, be slow to speak, right? These things should go hand in hand, but he wants to emphasize that to make sure that if we want to embody what God is doing in us, if we want to live out this great commandment, it starts in listening. Then he says, be slow to anger. Why? Because our earthly anger does not produce heavenly righteousness. Right, and I think that's a really poignant word for us to hear. A little aside, in, in the midst of this season, I don't know about you, but I like to justify my anger every single time I feel it as a righteous anger. Right, I pull that one scripture in the gospel where Jesus got angry, and I assume that every time I get angry, I'm being just like Jesus in that space. But instead, what if we perceive this cautionary warning that James says is be slow to anger, test that anger. Why? Because earthly anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God expects in us. And so we have this, this kind of idea, right, that if we want to live out the word of God living in us, if we want to live out the scriptures and the prophets and the law, it starts by listening. But then James jumps into this, this therefore and he says, so therefore get rid of all of the moral filth and the evil and humbly receive the word of God. And it feels like this, this completely opposite pivot, right? It feels like what James is telling us to do is, is to make a checklist of our life and make sure that we get rid of all of the bad things, that if we want to listen to others, if we want to receive this word of God that comes in us, we have to remediate everything bad in our lives and, oh yeah, all of the evil in our world as well. And usually that posture leads us to the complete opposite of listening. But I found out something really interesting this week. That word that we translate in English as filth is a direct derivative to the word for earwax. Okay, and, and that seems silly and that seems, seems odd, but then you, you think about it in the context. And what's James saying? He's saying... Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Therefore, remove the things that are obstructing your listening. Remove the things that are keeping you from receiving the word of God. Why is it that every time we pray for someone, we have opportunities to act upon that prayer? I think it's because prayer clears out the earwax so that we can hear the very thing that's been right in front of us the whole time, that we can listen to the word of God that he has placed in us, that we can respond to his invitation to care for and restore those in our lives. Dave Ferguson, in his book, recognizes that listening is, is pretty difficult in our culture. That, that we are not very good at listening, and even when we think we are listening, we probably aren't. Right? He says that the opposite of listening isn't speaking, it's waiting to speak. And I think that hits the nail on the head because I, I don't know about you, but more often than not when I am listening, all I'm doing is letting my mental wheels spin to figure out what I'm going to say in response. And sometimes that response is argumentative. Right? Sometimes I'm trying to defend my point of view, and so I'm pretending that I'm listening. I'm nodding my head and smiling, and, and I'm trying to, 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 to let that person know I'm hearing them. But really all I'm saying is, is, hey, how can I use what they've said to put them in a little bit of a hole? But, but it's not always that sinister, 
right? More often than not, our, our, our waiting to speak is, is waiting for the opportunity to say the thing that we think is gonna fix their problem. That they're sharing a hurt, and, and, and so immediately when they start sharing, we think, what can I say that's gonna make them feel better? What can I say that's gonna fix this problem for them? And in doing so, we are hearing them, but we aren't listening. It's this passive form of talking. But I think that's something that we need to think about. Because James seems to think that, that listening to others and listening to God is the foundation of our capacity to fulfill all of the scripture and law that's embodied in the commandment to love God and love others. And so today we're, we're gonna have a tip for listening. And, and when I say tip, I don't mean a, a singular piece of advice. Instead, tip is an acronym of three characteristics of active listening that invite the word of God to come alive in us uh, so that we might love our neighbor. I know for those of you who are following along, uh, we have an acronym series with an acronym in it. This is like acronym inception right now. Uh, who knows, maybe over the course of the next few weeks, we're just going to keep unpacking these nesting dolls of acronyms, okay? Uh, but, but hey, I, I find it to be pretty fun and easy to remember. So, so this tip is an acronym, and it starts by recognizing that if we are going to listen in a way that's formative and redemptive in our neighborhoods, it starts with time. Simply put, listening takes time. And time is one of the most precious commodities that we have. Time is one of the things that, that, that I am least apt to surrender to someone else. It breaks my heart, but so often people start a conversation with me by saying, Pete, I know that you're very busy, but. And it breaks my heart, not because it's not true, because, but because there's this reality that I have demonstrated visibly to them that my time is more valuable than they are. That my schedule is more important than the person sitting right in front of me. I, I, the algorithm must have been working because in between services, my phone uh, queued up this, this quote. And, and the, the quote said that 50% of Jesus' miracles in the gospel were interruptions. And I love that. That Jesus who has these plans, Jesus who has these intentions, Jesus that has this mission and this purpose that is so much more important than any of my plans was willing to let his time be interrupted to listen to others, to be with others, to, to hear others. And yet if you're anything like me, you allow your busyness to be the reason that you don't care for the neighbor in your midst, that you don't love and bless that neighbor. You see, I had a, a neighbor in Chicago, uh, and, and he was one of these guys that, that just loved to talk. He, he, he was just craving social interaction, right? And I remember any time I came out of the house and I bumped into the neighbor, it was like he was waiting for me to leave. And he, he would come over and he'd say, hey, do you have a minute? And, and more often than not, what he meant is, do you have 30 minutes or 40 minutes or 50 minutes, right? And, and so we got to this point where I was actively avoiding my neighbor, right? I would slip out the back door of my house, kind of go in the garage that was detached and, 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 and I'd slide out the driveway as quickly as I could. If I would see him there and he was kind of flagging me down, I'd act like I didn't see him and I would just pull out. And, and, and the whole point of that was because I, I, I felt like I was too busy. I didn't have the time to sacrifice 30 minutes every time I went outside of my house. And, and, and so I bought into this reality that my time was more important than my neighbor. That was until COVID hit, right? Because when COVID hit, suddenly I had a lot of time. The things that were occupying my busy schedule weren't happening anymore. And, and I was kind of craving that social interaction. I'm a little bit of an extrovert, as you might suspect. And, and, and so I found that I started looking for my neighbor. I'd walk out with my cup of coffee and I'd stand there hoping that, that, that he would come out. And suddenly our roles were reversed because my neighbor was a first responder. 
He was working at the hospital, which meant he had late nights and crazy hours, and he would have overnight shifts, and yet he still would come out and we would talk. We would talk for 30, 40, 50 minutes, and and in those conversations, something really interesting happened. I started to receive tangible opportunities to bless him, to show I loved him. Right, because of his crazy schedule, he and his wife uh, sometimes had gaps between their shifts at the hospital where, where their fourth grade daughter, who was now at home trying to, trying to do online education, didn't have anyone with her. And so Brittany and I were able to stop over at their house and make sure we could help her if she had any questions. Because they sometimes had these overnight shifts and, and, and a relative would take their daughter, but their dog would be at the house with no one to let them out. And so I would go and, and let the dog out. They're really simple things. Right, but they made an impact on my neighbor. And in fact, in that listening, he found ways to bless us. He was the first person that came over when our basement flooded during COVID and helped me tear out the floors and and, and put in new ones. When we listen, when we give people time, it opens up opportunities to actively embody this great commandment to love our neighbor. And this isn't gonna happen every time. And this isn't the intention But this man who hadn't been to church since he was an elementary schooler started going to church with us when COVID ended. His family started to participate in the children's ministry. Why? Because he had experienced this practical embodiment of this great commandment because we had sacrificed time and saw a neighbor as more important than our schedule. But here's the thing, time isn't effective if it's not first intentional. And what I mean by that is that you can spend a lot of time with someone without ever listening to them. You can have a a friend or neighbor come over and watch a football game with you and all you've done is watch a football game. Or before you invite them, you can set your mind, you can set your heart with an intention to care for, to listen, to love, and to bless them and that's gonna shape that gathering together. I was talking with my friend, uh, Seth Gordy, a couple of weeks ago, and he shared with me that every time he went to the barber, he would pray that God would use his time with the barber that he might bless them. And I found that to be so powerful and convicting because he was setting his intention. He was recognizing the everyday mundane moments of his life as an opportunity to live missionally in his computer. And I don't know about you, in his community, not his computer, in his community. (laughs) And I don't know about you, but when I go to the barber, my intention is to get my hair cut. And usually as quickly as I possibly can get it cut. And in fact, uh, this Tuesday, though, I had an opportunity Uh, to live that out. I I had to get a haircut. Brittany told me that we had family photos and that I looked terrible. And so uh, on Tuesday, I went and got a haircut. We had family photos. It was a total train wreck, but I'm sure there are gonna be some beautiful pictures that come from it because like Matt, the miracles of Photoshop. Um, But but I had to get my haircut and I decided to to test out this practice. And so on my way to the haircut, I, I prayed that God would use that time for me to be able to listen and be a tangible blessing Uh, to my barber. And so I showed up and I had a very different posture. I wasn't trying to rush. I wasn't trying to keep my mouth shut so they would just cut my hair. Instead, I was sitting and I was intentionally with him, listening to him. And, And wouldn't you know, the haircut took an hour and 15 minutes, right? And my hair should not take an hour and 15 minutes. But we just were having this conversation. And let me say, nothing miraculous happened. But what did happen is suddenly I got to know a barber that I had been sitting in his chair for three years a whole lot better. And one of the things that I learned was that he likes to wake up really early in the morning, like 4.30 in the morning, so that he can get out out of his house and, and go work out at the gym. And the other thing I learned is that he's constantly looking to find guys to connect with and work out with. Right, And so at the end of our, uh, our time together, I thought to myself, I wonder if he might be interested in, in, in being invited to a program called F3 here in Alamance County. We host it on Tuesday mornings, but it's, it's also all over the community. There are 14 different locations. And their three tenants are, 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 are fitness, fellowship, and faith. It was an opportunity to invite him into a community that met early in the morning 
that had fitness and fellowship as a part of it. And I don't know if he's gonna go, but what I do know is that if I hadn't been intentional to listen to him in that moment, I wouldn't have been able to extend that invitation. You see, but the most important tip for us listening actively in a way that allows the Spirit of God to work powerfully in our communities is our presence. And when I say presence, I don't mean that we are to be physically present, even though we we need to be, but instead that we are emotionally and spiritually present to the people that are before us. And in a digital world where we have distractions in our pocket 24-7, this is perhaps the most difficult characteristic of listening for me. But when we're present, something happens. When we're present, suddenly we can hear God and his word that comes alive in us as we seek to redeem his creation. Dave Ferguson in his book has this little experiment that he likes to do. And we're gonna try it out today because I think it's really powerful. He he tells us to take 20 seconds to be silent. And in those 20 seconds of silence, he invites us to to take mental note of every single thing that we hear. Okay, so we're going to do this in just a second. So everyone needs to focus here because I had a few people that thought I was having a moment uh, in the last service. Okay, we're going to be silent for 20 seconds. And in that 20 seconds, we're going to take mental notes of anything that we hear. So nobody come up here and comfort me or console me. I'm good. Uh, But we're going to take 20 seconds of silence. Are we ready? All right, go. All right, what did we hear? I imagine some of us heard me shuffling my notes or or, or clearing my throat. Maybe some of us with with the best ears could hear uh, the joyful cheers of our children's ministry as they have Pop-Tarts in their pajamas. Some of us probably heard our own breath as we carefully tried to slow it and be quiet so that our spouse wouldn't elbow us in the ribs because we were breathing too loudly. Uh, Maybe that's just my experience. What I find so interesting is Dave Ferguson says that even before we were silent, we were hearing those things. Our ears were receiving those audio inputs, but they were prioritizing our listening to the loudest voice. And for most of us, that loudest voice is gonna be me, right? I'm I'm pretty loud regardless of whether or not I have a microphone on. It's a spiritual gift. But not for all of us. For some of us, the the loudest voice that's robbing us of our presence is the argument that we had last night with our spouse or Friday with our spouse. Our mind has just been spinning, thinking about this thing for, for the last 48 hours and it's pulling us away from every conversation that we have. It's pulling us away from every experience that we have. For some of us, we're, we're thinking about this election and we're thinking about what's gonna happen on Tuesday and our minds are just consumed with all these different variables. It's consumed with this fear and this worry and this anxiety and guess what? It's robbing us of our presence with others. For some of us, our minds are are just about the, the daily things that we have to get done this afternoon. I'll admit to you that I've sat in these pews and used those Sunday guides to write down my grocery list so that I could be ready for after church and getting all the food and and make sure that we're well fed for the week. But the point is, is that if we're not intentional, if we don't take time, if we're not present, the loudest voice will always be the one that we listen to. And if the loudest voice is always the one that we're listening to, we will always miss opportunities to be a blessing to others. James wraps up this chapter, verses 26 through 27, and he pairs this this unique reality together in, in a way that just cuts to the core. Those who consider themselves 
religious, those who consider themselves in a walk with Jesus and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, do not listen, deceive themselves. And their religion, their faith is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Let that sink in. James's perception of our ability to walk authentically in a faith journey with Jesus begins with our capacity to listen. It begins with our capacity to be present to others. Why? Because when we're present to them, when we listen to their voices, we have opportunities to bless the vulnerable in our midst. For the early church, the vulnerable in their midst were widows and orphans. Those that had been discarded by culture, that had been forgotten, that had been oppressed by the communities around them that did not have a voice. They had a voice in the church that was slow to speak and quick to listen. For us, it may be the widows and the orphans in our midst as well, but it also could be the neighbor a few doors down that, that's a single parent and is just struggling to get kids to all of their practices and, and, and activities and, and, and keep all of the balls in the air that they're juggling and they just need someone to see them and not judge them and be present to them and help them out in the carpool line. For some of us, it's gonna be the neighbor next door who's been out of work for six months, who we don't wanna talk to because we're afraid they're gonna ask us for money, they're gonna afraid that they're gonna ask us for help, but they're feeling this crushing weight of their inability to provide for their family and, and all it would take to give them a breath is a hot meal on the table. For some of us, it's, it's the teenager that lives across the street that's always driving their car way too fast in our neighborhood, that's always playing their music way too loud, that's constantly agitating us, that we think of as a nuisance, but also is experiencing the crippling depression of feeling like they're not enough, feeling like they'll never live up to the expectations of their culture or maybe their parents. And so we have an opportunity to listen to the loudest voice, the voice that tells them to slow down, the voice that says they need to be quiet, the voice that says they're being a nuisance, or we can listen to that still soft voice that says that, 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 that student, that teenager just needs somebody that accepts them and loves them and cares for them unconditionally. You see, we are invited to be the practical embodiment of Jesus' command to love our neighbors. To respond in expectation to the needs that God places in our path. And to extend the gospel message of Jesus' love for them freely. But that only happens when we listen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we admit that we are quick to speak and slow to listen. Lord, that we find ourselves in a season of justified anger. But Lord, we pray that today we would stop in our tracks. Lord, we would pray expectantly for opportunities to listen. Lord, to receive humbly your word imparted within us in a way that leads us to sacrifice our time to mark our steps with intention and be present to the vulnerable in our midst Lord we pray that we as a church would be a people known in the midst of the chaos as a community that desperately seeks to bless and love our neighbors Lord, in our listening, that we would become conduits of your restoration and redemption. 
And Lord, that we would multiply your lights in our community so that all may see your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.